Okay, welcome everyone to this special session on um, on Easy Build. Um, yesterday, November thirteenth, was exactly ten years ago that we uh, published Easy Build one point zero, um, and I didn't want to let this pass without uh, doing something special. Um, so here we go. So the purpose for uh, this talk is to look back a bit at the previous decade. Uh, where do we come from? Um, how did EasyBuild actually came to be? Um, I'll go through a couple of major EasyBuild features that you should know about and hopefully know about already. And if not, um, you really should look into them. A bit about the EasyBuild community and the lessons we've learned throughout the years. And then also looking forward, so what are we currently working on? Uh, what is coming really soon? And also some exciting opportunities that we see ahead for EasyBuild and related projects. And then at the end, uh, there'll be a nice surprise as well. So over a decade of EasyBuild, it's actually over a decade because if we look uh, before EasyBuild 1.0, uh, it was already there. Um, the first public re release of EasyBuild was 0 0.5 in April 2012. And before that, uh, there was a lot of in-house development. Um, 10 years is a long time. And over those 10 years, we've gone through different eras or different phases. So the first part was definitely the in-house development where nobody uh, outside of uh, our team and the Flemish Supercomputing Center knew about EasyBuild. At some point, we did the public release, 2012. We started getting first users outside of our team, um, get, getting lots of feedback, doing some promotion. Um, that kick-started the EasyBuild community. So that's the third era. Um, and then we matured the project a bit and had a big spike in the number of supported software packages. Um, in 3.0, we added support for specific features like RPOT and hooks. And that was also the start of the EasyBuild maintainers team. And then EasyBuild 4.x, what we're currently playing with is uh, the first, well, the first EasyBuild version that was compatible with Python 3 uh, was EasyBuild 4.0. And from then on, lots of enhancements and, and um, update, software updates have been added, of course. So that's a lot of releases. We're uh, getting close to having uh, 100 easy build releases quite soon. Maybe in 2023, uh, we will hit that. So that's a lot of work that has gone in into this. Um, easy build started um, in-house mainly to scratch our own itch. So to deal with the problems that we were having um, as a, a new HPC team. So the team was really started in 2008 um, and our first central um, supercomputer at Ghent University was, uh, was installed 2009. And pretty quickly it was clear that dealing with incoming software installation requests was gonna be a big problem. Uh, the manpower back then was very limited. It was two technical people and a manager um, and they had to do everything basically from the hardware uh, problems to the system administration, OS updates, and also the user support and providing software installations to the, the researchers. That was gonna be impossible if everything had to be done by hand, uh, which is apparently what lots of other uh, teams were doing. And so we wanted to do, or we had to uh, automate that, uh, that effort a bit. Now we, we didn't really knew, knew what we were doing Initially, we weren't, we didn't have a lot of experience with software development, let alone publishing open source software. And we sort of learned things on the go. Um, and yeah, you can definitely see that throughout the, throughout the years. What made a, a big difference is that we had a couple of very good student interns um, who helped a lot with even redesigning EasyBuild a couple of times from scratch, essentially just pulling things apart, putting it back together in a better way. Um, we had students learning us about tests and why we need tests. We didn't have any tests at all. We figured we, we didn't need any because we knew the code base quite well. Uh, but they showed us that uh, just by writing tests, you can very quickly fix, bu uh, find bugs and fix them. They also helped out with developing a couple of uh, features and so on. So the original code base was so bad that the, the PyLint um, code style checker gave uh, a negative score. So you can, it gives you like a score from zero to 10 or something. And if it's really, really bad, it goes below zero. So initially the code was way below zero and the students helped us a lot uh, by cleaning it up and improving it. 
But just for some context, this was back uh, with Scientific, Scientific Linux 5, Python 2.4. So this is a very long time ago. Um, at some point, uh, we started to wonder if this could be useful also to, to other people. So I mean, it looked like it was working for us pretty well. Um, and we couldn't find solutions out there that other people were using. So we figured maybe this could help others as well. Um, so we wanted to make it available. Uh, mostly to get feedback because we still felt that maybe we were missing something. Maybe other people were using this fantastic tool that solves all your problems when installing software and they were not telling others about it. I don't know. Um, and before we could do that, we needed a logo. So we, we started playing around with some ideas, which you can see on the slide. Um, and in the end, we um, drew something on the whiteboard after having a couple of beers which looked like a good idea. And then literally this um, screenshot or this picture of the, the logo on the whiteboard became our final logo. Um, and it has served us well uh, over the last decade. So then in 2012, we were finally ready. Uh, we were confident enough about the code base to make it available publicly, so we did. Um, we created a GitHub repository in March, 2012. Um, so switching away from our private SVN repository. And we, we quickly figured it was a good idea to split up um, things across uh, four different repositories. As you know, framework, easy blocks, easy configs, and also the, the documentation. Then we did a release, or at least we tagged the version um, in our GitHub repository in April, 2012. Uh, this was very, very uh, early. It was like, a, again, a cleaned up version of our internal code base and all it supported was building HPL with a, what was then called the Goalf toolchain. So GCC, OpenMPI, Atlas, Laypack, and FFTW. So you can only build HPL with it, nothing else. There was some documentation on the wiki page, but we only copy pasted some stuff from our internal documentation. It was not very user-friendly. Um, and there was not even an EB command yet. So there was a script that this did some stuff, but there was nothing as clean as an EP command. So the screenshot shows how the repository looked back then. It looks pretty empty. Everything is, of course, in the easy build directory, um, but it's, it's very different from what it is today. So it was about 6,000 lines of Python code, 23 easy config files, and nine easy blocks. That was it. So very a very lightweight first release. Then the main reason to push out that release is because we got a talk accepted at the HAPIX uh, spring workshop. So HAPIX is a high energy physics conference um, about easy build. And of course we wanted to have some code um, to show um, to whoever was interested. I found the slides and I didn't actually do this talk. This was a colleague back then, Jens Timmerman, um, who gave the actual talk. The slides are still available. So here's some screenshots. Um, we mentioned that we had support for over 250 software packages already back then, but we didn't actually uh, include all that code in EasyBuild uh, 0.5 yet. We were still cleaning things up and putting it um, in the public release. Pretty shortly um, after doing that, we got some feedback on the EasyBuild IRC channel uh, where people were saying, oh, we're, we're reinventing what Gentoo has done with prefix and yeah, why are you actually doing that? That doesn't make sense. So they didn't really understand what we were doing or why we were doing it the way we were doing it. Um, but at least we were getting feedback, so that, that was good. Um, we then also made the EasyBuild mailing list public and the first person to actually subscribe to it outside of uh, the HPC again team, or at least uh, the Flemish HPC side was Fotis who was then, I think, working in, in Cyprus at the Cyprus Institute. So he noticed probably the talk at Hapix um, and was looking for a tool like this. And, and he, he was really the first person outside of our team who picked it up. Now the mailing list has about 300 subscribers, um, but most of the activity in terms of discussion, discussions and asking questions is actually going on on the EasyBuild Slack, which has over 600, 670 members. So that's, uh, that's quite good. Then still that same year, um, we wanted to make EasyBuild stable in the sense that we froze the, the EasyBuild framework API. So if people were developing their own um, easy blocks for it, 
we could give them some kind of guarantee that things wouldn't break over and over again with every easy build release. Um, so we, we gave some uh, um, some certainty about it being stable. Now, the easy build release 1.0 itself was done on November 13th. And this was hours before it was going to be presented at the Pi HPC workshop at Supercomputing 2012. And the paper and the slides of that are still available. Uh, yeah, so this included support for 148 software packages, about 21,000 lines of code, uh, 76 easy blocks, and 300 something easy configs. And the, the feedback we got from this was, was pretty positive. So people, uh, some people like the Andy Jarrell, uh, where they showed the tweets of is saying that this is the, the best thing he'll take or the coolest thing he'll take home from supercomputing. And that was a very nice feedback. So people seem to be happy. And we seem to have found a hole in the market where nobody else was working on a tool like this, uh, which is good. And of course, this, this, this motivated us to continue with the development and making sure that whatever we could share publicly was being shared publicly. And this really started the easy build community. So more and more people started picking up on easy build and started to use it, not only use it, but also actively helping out with fixing bugs or adding support for more software, adding features and so on. Uh, we also started organizing hackathons where we wanted to brainstorm about easy build, like what should it be able to do? How can we implement this? Uh, where should the focus be? Uh, and how to make it bigger, make it, make it uh, make it support more software and so on. We Shortly after, we also set up the, the now well-known EasyBuild conference calls. Every two weeks, we have an EasyBuild conference call. Anyone is, uh, uh, is welcome to join in. We usually discuss recent developments and usually we have some time for questions um, and providing some answers as well. And it's very rare that we actually skip one of these calls. So you can, you can rely on them being there if you need any help with EasyBuild. We also looked into other ways of promoting EasyBuild a bit indirectly. So we proposed getting scientific software installed birds of a feather sessions and both supercomputing and ISC, um, where of course we wanted to give ourselves a platform to promote EasyBuild a, a bit more and on a more regular basis. But we also looked at, um, at other tools related. So LMOD uh, was being discussed there as well. We also invited Todd Gamblin um, when SPAC was created to talk about SPAC at these sessions and so on. So we, we were very open to also promoting other tools and, and uh, making it very clear that we are not the only ones in this space. Also the dev rooms at FOSDEM, the HPC dev rooms were initially created sort of to have an excuse to also be able to present easy build at FOSDEM. Uh, but these dev rooms have been going on pretty much continuously since 2014 and have been, um, have been quite successful as well. Uh, then later, uh, we started doing easy build user meetings. So basically stepping away from the hackathon model uh, and going more towards user meetings. And related to those user meetings, we also did user surveys on a yearly basis since 2017 to get a better, um, a better view on the easy build community. So how people were using easy build, what to define important, uh, on what type of systems they're using it and so on. Then more, re more recently, we finally got a tutorial accepted at ISC. We tried multiple times. And uh, in the COVID year 2020 was the first time we actually got the tutorial accepted. The tutorials were actually uh, canceled at that year at ISC for, for the, due to the, the pandemic. And it only ended up being presented in 2021. But we did get our foot in the door there. And also this year, we had a tutorial there. And we hope to have one next year as well. Now, one thing that's very difficult uh, when doing open source software is to get a good view on uh, how many people, how many HPC sites are using it. Since everyone can just pull it down from the web and doesn't have to tell you that they're, they're playing with it, uh, you don't really know who's using it. So the, the best way we've come up with is looking at the visits to the easy build documentation, uh, where you can at least see from which cities uh, people are accessing the documentation and how frequently they're doing that. Um, so the, the screenshot of the, the world map shows you the cities from where EasyBuild was visited in the last year and how many times. So the bigger the, uh, the sphere, the more it was visited. And currently we have over 1000 page views per week in the EasyBuild documentation. So that's, that's definitely not bad. It's getting lots of, uh, 
uh, lots of reads. The logos at the bottom show you some of the bigger or more active um, sites that are using EasyBuild today, but it goes way beyond uh, these, uh, these universities and these institutes, of course. So then back to the hackathons. Um, people who picked up EasyBuild early on also were, were very keen in, in getting involved with um, but development. Fortis was definitely very, uh, very active there in the early years of EasyBuild and actively helped out with setting up these, uh, these events. Uh, the first one was actually organized in Ghent itself and the only outside visitor was Fortis. So he, he came in, I think from Luxembourg um, and yeah, just wanted to discuss with us what EasyBuild can currently do um, and what should uh, what we should work on next in terms of support and and software packages. Um, you can also see Todd Gamblin. So on the picture on the top right, um, Todd also joined us for a couple of these hackathons and to exchange ideas uh, with stuff he was working on in SPAC and things we were working on in, in EasyBuild. Uh, and all of the notes and the slides from all of these hackathons are still available on the EasyBuild wiki. Um, then, of course, we also continue to do promotion about easy builds um, whenever we got the chance and lots of other people did the same thing as well. Uh, our Twitter account has been quite active over the years. We now have 666 followers and I didn't gain this in any way. Um, there's also some interesting quotes on in certain talks where George from the Cypress Institute, for example, said that easy build saved his life. So without it, it would be very difficult to do the work he's been doing. Uh, we handed out stickers, we handed out coffee mugs, and we will keep doing that uh, whenever we see the chance as well. Uh, I've been interviewed for a, a podcast. Uh, we had EasyBuild cake at some point. So when there was five years, the five year celebration of EasyBuild 1.0 um, was celebrated at Supercomputing 2017. So somebody uh, ordered cake with the EasyBuild logo on it. And that was uh, lots of fun to see. Um, and the, the picture on, on FOSDEM, so the middle sort of bottom middle, is the first time the, that we had seven easy build maintainers in the same room. Uh, we actually have over 20 easy build maintainers today. So maybe at some point we will, we will do better than that. Then the, the user meetings, so this, these kind of evolved from the hackathons where uh, we saw a bit of a shift into uh, what people wanted to discuss or, or wanted to talk about at the hackathons. Uh, it was less of hands on development and more discussions and showing each other how they are using EasyBuild or in what context and, and, and how it was configured and for what reason and so on. Um, so this is what the user meetings still are today. These have actually been very well attended. So the first couple of uh, user meetings had 20, 30 attendees, uh, but the last physical one in Barcelona early 2020 had over 50 people uh, actively joining with some people flying in from the US or, or Australia. So that's a, uh, that's quite unexpected, I would say, and that, that's quite a, a good sign of the uh, of the maturity of the EasyBuild community. Uh, what we've always done from the very start is, um, at the very least, record all these talks and also stream them. And all of these uh, all of these talks are still available on the EasyBuild YouTube channel. So we hope we can keep this up, um, and at the very least, make this hybrid um, events where, if people can travel or don't have the time to make the trip, uh, they can still follow along. Now, of course, the, the previous two um, sessions or the previous two events were fully virtual through Zoom and, and Slack due to the, uh, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, but we think it's, uh, it's now safe enough again to have a physical easy build user meeting again next year. Um, and we are going to move away from, uh, from winter time in Europe uh, just to hopefully avoid some of the trouble. So we're currently looking at April, May or something um, to organize the next meeting. Now, this is, nothing is set in stone there. The date or the location is not fixed yet, so we're currently looking into this, but you'll hear about this soon. And of course, hopefully we'll, uh, we will break the record of attendees, at least at the physical events. We'll see how that goes. Then looking at some of the, the major easy build features that were developed over the years. So all of these are, uh, are documented either in the easy build documentation itself, or if not, uh, they are covered in the easy build tutorials. Um, of course, lots of features were implemented over the years in EasyBuild. A lot of these are driven by the community, either by 
suggestions or questions uh, by, by people using EasyBuild or quite often also people who actually implemented the features themselves and then uh, sent us pull requests uh, to get them integrated into EasyBuild itself. There's lots of examples here. I won't discuss all of these, um, but if you're not aware of some of these things on the list, they're definitely worth looking into. Uh, one of the major features that was implemented uh, by people outside of the HPC UGAN team was support for hierarchical module naming schemes. So the, the ULIC Supercomputing Center was a, a big uh, driving force behind this, uh, especially Marcus Geimer spent quite a bit of time on this uh, during the early hackathons. Um, so the intent is to organize your modules in a different way um, that you have very short module names and that you can only load modules which are compatible with each other. So as the picture shows, um, you have a GCC module and only if you load that GCC module, additional modules become available that are compatible with, th with this version of GCC. And then the same thing for the, uh, for the MPI module. If you load a particular version of OpenMPI, then more software becomes available that, that is uh, linked to this MPI uh, library. And now this was a lot of uh, a lot of effort to get right because there's lots of tricky uh, things to keep in mind here um, and communication with LMOD or putting things in a certain way so LMOD is happy uh, when consuming this module tree. So this was this was not easy to implement, but it was done in a way that you can actually define your own hierarchical module tree if you want to. So the, the classic one is has three levels as shown in the picture, a core level, a compiler level, and an API level. But you can make this uh, three as deep as you want to with, with additional levels if you want to, as long as you're careful enough in the, in the implementation of the naming scheme. So all you basically do here is you implement a small Python module that describes where the modules should go in the module tree. And then EasyBuild takes care of the rest. Then um, one of the key features in EasyBuild is definitely the integration we have with GitHub. Um, so this was actually implemented out of need. We were starting to get too many contributions. There was not enough structure um, in the contributions. Um, many people wanted to contribute, but were not familiar enough with Git or GitHub. And to some extent, we still see this happening today. Um, so we felt we had to do something about this. We wanted to uh, avoid that people had to do all the uh, all the commands to rename easy config files, put them in the right place, start a branch, um, push it to GitHub, and then go ahead in GitHub and open the pull request in the right way, targeting the develop branch and putting the right information in the PR title or the PR description. Um, so we ended up automating that whole process so you can uh, straight from the easy build command line open the pull request and you don't have to um, give the, the file name uh, the correct name or something easy build can figure out how it should be named and how where it should be placed and so on. Um, so this saves a lot of time both for the contributor but also for the, the easy build maintainers who review um, the pull requests because everything is very well structured. And we know there are certain things that we don't have to uh, keep an eye out for, like the naming of the easy config files, the location, the target branch should be developed. All of this is taken care of automatically if the pull request is opened with, uh, with new PR. Uh, so this was a big help. And next to new PR, there are various uh, related features as well, like pulling easy config files from a pull request or uploading a test report uh, when you're doing an installation from a pull request updating pull requests. Um, so there's lots of uh, small variations or related actions here that you can that you can do straight from the easy build command line. And it's really, it has been a game changer, I think, uh, in terms of getting contributions. And a small thing, but I think a very useful thing, and maybe something we should even enable by default in the next major version of easy build is the, the trace output mode. Um, so by default, easy build will not tell you a lot of what's going on in the background. It will just give you uh, lines like preparing or installing or building uh, without actually showing you what's going on uh, in the background. If you enable trace mode, you will get a lot more detail, but without it flooding your screen um, with lots of excess information. So when it does the prepare step and when it's setting up the build environment, it will show you which modules are being loaded, for example. Uh, when it's doing actual installations, it will show you which command is being run and where the output of that command is being stored. So if you want to, you can tail that log file and see um, 
what that command is actually uh, doing and, and how it's progressing. Uh, you will get timestamps as well, so you can check on things. If something is taking too long, um, you can uh, you can quickly spot it. So this is very, very useful. Um, and I definitely uh, strongly encourage you to configure Easy Build to always do this uh, because in, at least in my experience, it doesn't get in the way, it only helps. Now, another um, mode is the dry run mode. And this is very different from trace because this will, um, actually just look at how easy build would install something without actually doing it. So this will always run in a matter of seconds um, because it's not actually installing anything. It will just show you the commands um, that would be run if you if easy build does this installation. So if you use eb-x, you will get an answer as shown on the slide. So it will show you during the build step method, which type of commands or which commands will be run and in which location um, and for example, for the sanity check, it will tell you what EasyBuild will check for uh, before declaring success on the installation. So this is very useful. It, it opens up uh, the black box that people were, uh, yeah, that people felt that EasyBuild was to them. So they didn't really know what was going on or what EasyBuild was going to do um, with the eb -x, -x, x option. Um, you can actually get that information straight away and very quickly. Uh, so this is, a, I think, a very good idea if you're wondering uh, what EasyBuild will do or how an, a change to an easy block or an easy config file will affect the installation. It's very easy to tell um, if this will actually be picked up or not. Then another key feature, and this is this was implemented uh, relatively recently. Um, is the support for customizing the functionality of EasyBuild with hooks. Um, so throughout the EasyBuild code base, we've, uh, we do callbacks to uh, hook Python functions um, if they are defined. Um, and in these Python functions, which you can uh, fully control yourself, um, you can do any additional actions. You can run checks or you can run additional shell commands. You can even manipulate internal data structures of EasyBuild. Um, to make changes to what EasyBuild would do by default. Uh, so this is relatively easy to use and it's a very powerful feature uh, because you can really change anything almost um, to what EasyBuild does uh, by adding a small amount of Python code. So the example in the slide is uh, shows you how you can customize the configure options for OpenAPI with a pre-configure hook. So you're basically telling EasyBuild if you're installing OpenAPI and you have with verbs in the list of configure options, then you should replace that with without verbs instead, and then just continue with the installation as you would do normally. Uh, so yeah, this is a very easy way to customize EasyBuild and keep track of, of things um, in your own uh, version control uh, setup. Now, some sites are really using this quite extensively. Um, there's a, a presentation at the last EasyBuild user meeting by uh, the University of Brussels that show how they um, build open MPI and other MPI libraries for their heterogeneous setup where they have a mix of different uh, interconnects in their system. Um, so they, they do lots of uh, detection and tweaking of configure options there uh, through their hooks. And then perhaps the most recent feature, um, big feature worth mentioning is the richer output that EasyBuild can give you. Uh, so for this, we leverage the rich Python package um, it's not a required dependency, but if it is installed, um, EasyBuild will use it to give more colorful output or to give progress bars uh, whenever it's downloading files or uh, running an installation. Um, when it's installing extensions, which, which could be uh, over a thousand, for example, for recent um, R easy configs, it will tell you how many ex extensions are done, how many are still left, how much time has been spent up until now on the installation and so on. But it gives you a, a concise and a colorful overview of, um, of how EasyBuild is progressing. Now, and this is also something I strongly recommend. So all you need to do is to install the rich Python package with the same Python version as EasyBuild is using, um, and then this will be enabled automatically. Okay, so next to all the features that we have implemented over the years, a big part of EasyBuild is of course the software that is supported um, by EasyBuild, so what you can install uh, with EasyBuild. Uh, this has been increasing over the years, of course, um, and we even see it increasing more quickly 
in the last couple of years. So we're adding about 400 extra uh, software applications and libraries per year to EasyBuild, so what it can support. This does not include versions, so this is unique, um, different software projects. And this also doesn't include what we call extensions. So things like Python packages, our libraries are usually installed as extensions to something else. Um, so those are not included in, in these counts. So very soon we're going to break the uh, the threshold of over 3,000 supported software packages. And if you would count extensions, you'll you'll have to add over 2,000 um, to that count. So we're, we're going to break the the 5,000 uh, mark there in terms of different supported software projects. Now there's a small decline there in the graph. Um, so this this is when we uh, archived very old Easy Configs in Easy Build 4.0, uh, which were only using very old tool chains and this is typically dead software um, that nobody is interested in anymore so um, that's why we had a small decline there uh, and we're, we're probably going to have a decline like this again in the next major version of easy build so overall this is a this is good so we keep adding support for more software to easy build but it's also scary because this trend is not slowing down so it, it seems like there's an a bottomless pit of research software that we'll have to keep adding um, and new packages keep coming up uh, from new domains things like bioinformatics machine learning ai so uh, so new projects are being created probably every day um, and i don't expect this effort to slow down uh, anytime soon now all of this software um, support doesn't come automatically of course this is uh, this comes in through the contributions we get from the EasyBuild community and all the contributors that do a lot of hard work um, in opening pull requests and making sure those installations work um, and go through the, the fairly strict review process that we have uh, before we include something in EasyBuild. So we're, we're quite um, extensively testing contributions before we can actually merge them in. So we're currently uh, seeing about two and a half thousand easy config pull requests per year. So if you think about this per working day or something, that's over 10 pull requests per working day, which is quite a lot. Um, and that's beyond, that's without the framework and easy block PRs that, uh, that often go along with it as well. In the last decade, we have seen over 25,000 pull requests being opened um, to easy build. So that's, that's quite big. These pull requests were opened by over 375 different people over the years um, and over the different repositories. And per year, we're currently seeing well over 100 unique uh, contributors. So 100 different people in 2020, 2021, and also this year, we've already broken our previous record in terms of uh, unique people. So we're, we're probably gonna have over 120 unique contributors uh, this year. Now, uh, there was a big impact here um, uh, by the GitHub integration feature. So the support for opening pull requests from the easy build command line. Um, this support was implemented because we were getting too many pull requests and they were not structured well enough. But we've probably shot ourselves in the foot there a bit by adding support to make it very easy to open pull requests. We've been getting way more, way more pull requests than we were uh, ever before. So you can see the support was implemented in 2016. And since then, it has been increasing quite a bit. Now, this is mostly OK because the pull requests have way better structure. And also for the easy build maintainers, it's way easier to process these pull requests. So even though we're getting a lot more, um, we're still quite happy with the GitHub integration that we have. Yeah, and all these contributions are uh, reviewed by easy build maintainers. Um, so in 2016, we were starting to get too many contributions for just the HPC UGAN team to handle. So we started uh, asking for help by um, experienced easy build, uh, yeah, experienced users of easy build and people who were very active in helping with already maybe reviewing pull requests or testing pull requests. So we started to reach out to some people and see if they would be up for helping out with processing contributions on a voluntary basis. Um, so to be clear, nobody is really being paid to do this. So they're doing it as a part of their job, um, their regular job, and they're just trying to find some, some time left and right, some hours in the week um, to help out with uh, reviewing pull requests and, and getting them tested and merged. 
Uh, we also have a rotating, what we call maintainer of the week role. We actually have two. Um, so two maintainers are um, responsible for looking into incoming issues and pull requests that week. And this is also on a best effort basis. So uh, the guideline is sort of to try to spend one hour per day that week to look at stuff that's, uh, that's incoming. And yeah, whether they hit that hour or not, or spend more time, that's absolutely fine. Um, so they just do what they can. Uh, last year, we also had the first Easy Build Maintainer Summit. So we're all, or as much as possible, Easy Build Maintainers were getting together uh, to discuss uh, on the short term which changes should be implemented in Easy Build, how we can more efficiently process contributions, and so on. Uh, we haven't planned the next Maintainer Summit yet, but we probably should um, sometime in the coming weeks or months. Um, so the Easy Build maintainers have been very, very important to Easy Build. Without them, there's absolutely no way that Easy Build will, would be um, uh, would be in the current state that it is. Um, so whenever you get the chance to thank an Easy Build maintainer, um, if you run into them, if you know them, uh, please buy them a coffee, please buy them a beer, or or thank them in some other way. So whenever you get the chance to do so, please do. Then there's a couple of things that, that we, or certainly I have learned um, over the years. Like I mentioned, we, have, we had pretty much zero experience with releasing software in the wild or doing open source software development. Um, so th these are a couple of uh, things that come to mind that we've learned over the years. So first of all, and I've, I've mentioned this multiple times, if you want to release open source software, and you think that's a good idea, Maybe it is, but be careful because if you start a community, then things will explode quite a bit. Um, and you'll have to somehow deal with that. And there's, you can find multiple stories um, by people that have burned out because they, they released some software um, out in the wild and it became somewhat popular. So you may want to think about uh, what you're going to do if that happens. So we were also not prepared with this, but somehow we, we found a way to deal with it by asking for help in time. Um, implementing features that um, make it easier to deal with incom incoming contributions um, and so on. So we're still quite busy, but I think we're more or less um, keeping up and we're spreading the load uh, well enough that, that we can keep doing that. In terms of promoting your project, the, the best way, the absolute best way to do so um, is word of mouth. So um, if you would like to get others to use your, your, uh, your project, give talks about it at every possible opportunity in different ways, podcasts, uh, classical presentations, giving demos. So everything you can do to show people the value of your work um, is something you will have to do. Um, so even then, even if you're doing this for over a decade, like we have, we still run into people every now and then which are in the HPC or the computational science community who have never heard about your tool before. So that's, this will keep happening no matter how many talks you give or how many promotion you do. Um, so people will still be surprised and still tell you, why didn't I know about this, even though you've been screaming from the rooftops for, for 10 years. And even if they have heard about your project, it doesn't mean they've actually tried it or they, they are convinced to really spend the time um, to start learning to use it. So uh, people really have to be convinced uh, before they start using your project. And the best way to do them is to somehow getting them to try it hands-on themselves. Even if it's only for 15 or 30 minutes, um, let them try it, let them play with it, and let them be amazed about what it can do and how much time it can save them. Also, making clear to people what your tool is actually doing um, is not easy. Um, so they may have some high-level idea or they may say, oh, this is just like Gentoo Prefix does, uh, and then why should I take why should I take a closer look at it? And, of course, when they look underneath the covers or when they start playing with it themselves, they realize there's there's more to it or there's a different aspect to it um, that was not immediately clear. So that's also, uh, uh, yeah, something that's very difficult to to uh, to get across. Um, if you're implementing new features, very often they will get overlooked, maybe because you didn't make enough noise about them, or maybe the documentation is not there or or not detailed enough. Um, so you'll have to keep pointing out these features over and over again when people ask questions um, and you shouldn't be surprised by that. So it's very easy to, um, to overlook that you're developing with this, this tool every day or using it every day 
while other people are may, maybe only using it once or twice a week. And then of course they are, they are going to overlook features or not know about recent developments. Also about incoming contributions, we've, we've seen this multiple times that somebody comes up with a very small pull request initially. Um, and it's very important that you're, you're trying to help them or try to explain them what they need to know to get that pull request in, because these people may grow out to be really, um, really good contributors, really frequent contributors, or people who have skills that you're currently missing in your contributor pool. So there, there are examples where people are uh, fixing bugs in GCC or complex libraries like OpenBLAS, um, and they're only still around in the project because we were very welcome that, welcoming to them initially. Um, and if we wouldn't have been, if they would have probably walked away and we would have missed out on getting all that experience into the project. And also the, the experience and the skills you have yourself and Git and GitHub definitely comes to mind here. Also, don't, don't take this for granted. So many people are not familiar uh, with things like this yet um, and maybe do want to make contributions, but you'll have to be patient or you have to be helpful to get them to the point where, where they can make the contribution uh, that they want to do. So this is also something that's very important and something that reflects as well in the GitHub integration that we have where we're trying to get rid of that hurdle. All right, so that was the, the last decade. So we're, since today we're starting a new decade um, for EasyBuild. Um, Easy, the project has grown quite a lot in the last 10 years and hopefully it will continue to do that in the next 10 years. It's impossible to tell um, whether this will happen or which roadblocks we will hit. Uh, but I think we have a good, we have figured out a good, pretty good approach by now. Um, on how to how to deal with contributions and how to get a project of this size uh, to keep it on the on the rails. Um, one thing we've never been really good at, and I guess the the lack of dedicated funding for the project is uh, is definitely part of that. Is that we're we're not very good at setting a clear roadmap. So things we we want to implement by a certain time, or or uh, that we want to change or support. Um, uh, we've never been able to set a, a very strict timeline to that. We could make promises like by the end of next year, we'll do this or that, uh, but it's probably very unlikely that we'll, we'll stick to those promises. So there's no point in, in making them. Um, so long-term long -term planning is very difficult, uh, at least today. We do have short-term plans. Um, so in the next months, week, weeks, months, and, and let's say next year, uh, there are a couple of things that we will be doing or are actively working on already. Um, one of these things is porting the EasyBuild documentation to Markdown. Uh, and I'll uh, have a separate slide on that coming up. Then the next EasyBuild release is probably going to be 4.7. Uh, so this is, let's say, weeks away, maybe by the end of the month, that should be there, depending on uh, whether we're hitting any issues or want to get in a particular feature before we do so. Um, we're also starting to think about the release of EasyBuild 5.0, so the next major version of EasyBuild, and have some more uh, specifics on that as well. And of course, the next EasyBuild user meeting is, a, is something that we're actively discussing on when that will happen and where it will happen. Um, in the longer term, we have lots of ideas, uh, small and big, um, but one thing we should definitely uh, spend some time on um, is significantly improving the error reporting that EasyBuild currently does. So whenever an installation fails, um, EasyBuild does keep track of all the, the information. The build error is going to be somewhere in the build log or maybe in a separate file in the build directory. Uh, but I think that EasyBuild can do a, a lot better job in, uh, in catching those actual build errors or pointing out uh, where they are and maybe even make some suggestions on how to fix them. Um, and then another long-term project is making Easy production ready. And I'll explain a bit more about Easy as well. So the first thing that we're currently very actively working on, and that's an effort that has only started a couple of weeks ago, um, is uh, improving the EasyBuild documentation. And the main thing we're doing here is porting what we have currently, uh, which is in restructured text and rendered restructured text and rendered with Sphinx, uh, is we're moving this to Markdown and MK Docs. Um, so in, in my experience, MK Docs is a way better tool than Sphinx is. For writing documentation, it lowers the bar um, to making changes to the, to the documentation quite a bit. Uh, the markdown syntax is also the same syntax that we're using in, in, in GitHub issues or GitHub wiki pages, GitHub pull requests. So the, the jump 
uh, to that format is a lot smaller than it is to RST. Um, and yeah, the current format is really holding us back in, in, uh, in different ways. So we're, we're currently not uh, maintaining the documentation well. Um, and I think part of that is because of the format. So we're, we're moving away from that and hopefully that will help. Um, the first part of this effort is really porting to the new format without really reviewing the contents of the documentation. Um, but in a later stage, once all the porting is done, we also hope to set up some kind of review cycle, uh, like one page every week or something, uh, where we, we look at that page in detail and see if there's any updates needed or if it's still accurate for the current um, easy build versions. Uh, with MKDocs, you can very easily get a local preview of the documentation while you're editing it. So as soon as you hit save in Vim or Emacs or whatever editor you're using, uh, the render documentation will automatically refresh. And that's uh, that's really helpful when, when writing documentation. You, you can see how it will actually look. Um, and also when the, uh, when the documentation is rendered with MKDocs, the search feature that MKDocs provides is also way more powerful way more instant. As soon as you start typing something, you'll get instant results and better search results as well in my experience, uh, which is also uh, it's very welcome. So all of this effort is being done in a separate repository. We're, we're pulling out the easy build documentation from the easy build repository into a separate easy build docs repository. Um, and one thing we will, we are doing and are, yeah, are trying, trying very hard is to make sure that existing links for docs.easybuild.io will not get broken. So even though we're gonna move everything to a new, new format and the new documentation has will have a slightly different structure, the existing links that you'll find in emails or God knows what uh, should keep working. And for this uh, ongoing effort, I, I would also like to thank Simon and James who have been spending quite a bit of time on this in the last two weeks um, and will we'll hopefully continue to do so. Um, but anyone who's willing to help out with this effort, either by looking at what has been ported already or by actively helping out with porting what still needs to be ported is very welcome. So for this, please take a look at the EasyBuild docs repository uh, where there are some clear instructions in the readme file on how to get started. Then looking ahead a uh, couple of months, let's say, um, is we're starting to think about the, re the release of EasyBuild 5.0. So this effort has not started yet, really, at least not the implementation part of it, uh, but we do have a pretty good view on uh, what should happen by then or what breaking changes we will make in EasyBuild 5.0. The biggest one, uh, which is hopefully gonna be of low impact is dropping the support for running EasyBuild on top of Python 2.7. Um, so Python 2.7 is end of life since January 1st, 2020, um, which is now uh, almost three years ago. Um, so we think it's time to, to pull the plug on the support of, of Python 2.7 in EasyBuild, at least on, in terms of running EasyBuild on top of Python 2.7. And hopefully the impact of this will be very small or non-existent. Um, just like in EasyBuild 4.0, we're also gonna archive the ancient easy config. So anything using an old tool chain, um, and that's anything using uh, GCC older than 8.0 or a common tool chain version older than 20, uh, 2019A um, is gonna be moved into an archive. So it's gonna stay in easy build, but we're not gonna test it anymore. And you should expect that it's gonna be broken um, quite soon. And then uh, and this is maybe gonna be the biggest uh, change in terms of impact um, is changing some defaults in the Python package easy block where we're gonna enable the use of pip and the running of pip check and the sanity check uh, will enable those by default. So that's the biggest back, backwards incompatible changes. There may be additional ones, but they're probably going to be small and the impact of those is going to be limited. And in any case, we're, we'll have very clear documentation of what has changed and how you can um, mitigate those changes if you are affected by them. Um, other major changes which we have in mind, which may um, only be implemented with EasyBuild 5.0, but may also happen earlier because we think we can do these uh, in a, uh, without breaking backwards compatibility um, is in a new function, a, a cleaner function to run shell commands. So the, the current run command function, the, that API is quite um, cryptic, I would say. Um, you, you can do things like uh, not fail when the shell command fails or get uh, uh, the standard out and standard error separately. 
uh, if you know how to do so. But it, it's very um, it's very unclear how to do that with the current API. So we're going to implement a new function um, for this with a cleaner API. We have lots of examples, lots of experience on how to run shell commands. So we can probably now design a better function for this. And also with, with some new capabilities. So there are ideas when a shell command fails, for example, that EasyBuild can drop you into an interactive shell and then you can start figuring out uh, why that command failed uh, in, the inf in the built environment that EasyBuild was running it. In. Um, so this could be very helpful. One thing we will also do is uh, basically copy the code of the loose version class, which is now part of the Python standard library. We're going to copy this into EasyBuild because uh, we're using it heavily throughout EasyBuild, both in EasyBuild framework and EasyBlocks. Um, and yeah, we basically have to cop either copy it or do something else because this is disappearing in the Python standard library. And we want to be ready for this uh, so we can keep supporting the future versions of EasyBuild uh, of Python 3 as well. Uh, there's several other ideas here uh, which are listed on the wiki page mentioned on top of, uh, of this slide. Um, most of which will still need to be discussed among the EasyBuild maintainers. But also if you have any additional suggestions or ideas for breaking changes that you think should happen in the next major EasyBuild version, uh, now is a good time to raise them. So open an issue in GitHub or mention them um, on Slack or on the mailing list because now is a good time um, to do so. We don't do major versions of EasyBuild quite often and we're, we're quite careful with making breaking changes. So if there's something that you think really should happen, then now is the time to bring it up. Then this is again, longer term, I guess, uh, beyond next year and in the years to come. Um, we see a bunch of challenges here for easy build. So uh, as you probably have noticed, the, the landscape of computational science is, is changing in various ways and changing quite fast. Um, so the explosion in, in available software projects that are relevant for researchers has already been happening quite a while. And that's why that line of supported software keeps going up for EasyBuild. Um, there's more additional domains. People are being pressured a bit more to publish their code and then other people are picking up on it. Um, and there's also wider adoption of HPC in general, like GPUs, for example. Um, so all of this has an effect on uh, the software that researchers are using. Um, there's also increasing interest in, in using the cloud, AWS, Azure, so all these commercial clouds or even um, private cloud setups um, are being used more and more. And this also has an impact on how software is being installed. Um, so uh, I think one thing we want to enable here is that people don't sacrifice performance when they're using these platforms, but they can still run binaries that are properly optimized for the hardware on which they are going to run. Um, and this is typically what doesn't happen with containers and Conda. So there people are sacrificing performance because they want to be able to run anywhere. And in our view, that doesn't really make sense. And I think we can avoid this. Uh, what's also definitely happening is an, an increasing variety in processor mi uh, microarchitecture. So in the last decade, um, certainly until a couple of years ago, Intel was still king in HPC. Basically every HPC cluster had Intel processors. Uh, this is changing, changing fast. Um, in the last couple of years, AMD is back in the game, which is already um, a bit of a head scratcher in terms of compilers and, and compiler tool chains that you're using and compiler options as well. Um, but then also we see ARM coming uh, quite rapidly. Uh, there's already lots of uh, HPC sets that have an ARM cluster, and this is only going to increase probably in the, in the future because it's going to be in terms of price performance, uh, way too attractive um, and it's going to be impossible to ignore. Um, power is still there, but it's pretty niche. And this is probably a, a dying breed in HPC. Um, but we do have the RISC V uh, CPUs, the, the open source CPUs, if you will, uh, which are coming quite fast as well. So the very capable RISC V CPUs are being actively designed and will be on the market quite soon. And there's a lot of uh, Euro HPC money going into the design and the research uh, on this. So and then in the next couple of years, this will be something else to worry about. Um, and then next to the CPUs, there's lots of uh, diversity in GPUs as well. Next to NVIDIA, there's AMD GPUs, there's Intel GPUs, and even beyond that, other accelerators like TPUs and IPUs and, and God knows what. Um, so this is, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going back to a way diverse um, system 
uh, system stack. And of course, this will directly affect building software for, for all of these variations. And then also what we want, what you see is a big shift towards Clang-based compilers. So the new Intel One API, the AMD compilers are all based on Clang. Um, so in some sense, that's more uniform, but all of these have small variations as well. And that's definitely gonna be a headache to, to deal with uh, too. So these are all things that whether we like it or not, we will have to worry about. We will have to somehow um, take into account into the EasyBuild project as well. Now, one thing um, that we are already working on and uh, to mitigate some of these problems um, is the Easy project. So the Easy project somehow evolved from the EasyBuild community to some extent. Um, so Easy here stands for the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. And if you're wondering whether this is gamed, so we can spell it Easy. Yes, it is. So that's not an accident. Um, what we want to do here is to build a, a central. Um, stack of optimized scientific software installation. So like you are currently installing your software on an NFS mount inside your cluster, we want to give you a file system that you can just mount on your system and that has all the software already pre-installed and, and properly optimized for, the, for your hardware. Um, so we, we know how to do this. Um, we're following the lead of what Compute Canada is doing there with CVMFS and having a compatibility layer and, and all these things. Um, I we want to make this a, a, a community project that basically grows from EasyBuild. But this is not going to replace EasyBuild. We're using EasyBuild as one of the tools in here to make this possible. Uh, so this is still, even though it's, it's a project that started in 2020, it's still in the early stages. We have a proof of concept setup, which we call our pilot repository, which is publicly available. So you can, you can um, get started with playing with that straight away if you follow, follow our documentation. And we have a long paper, an open access paper, where we explain these ideas and, and how we can build this up um, in detail. And this is a high level overview of the project. I'm not going to try and explain this in detail because there's a lot going on here. And as you can see from the logos, there's a lot of open source projects um, involved in here from CVMFS to Gen2 to Elmat and EasyBuild. Um, and special libraries like Archpack, we're using Singularity or Aptainer um, to build these software installations. And of course, this is heavily inspired by what Compute Canada has done for their uh, software stack. Um, what we are doing here is we're, we're from the ground up taking into account that we have an increasing variety in, in uh, types of CPUs, Intel, AMD, ARM, and also RISC-V in the future. Uh, we hope to uh, support all of these and also the different uh, generations of these. So different generations of Intel CPUs will provide uh, separate software installations for, so they are properly uh, optimized. Uh, the core idea here is that you, you as a researcher, um, can basically go from zero to doing running your scientific workloads in, in three easy steps. The first step is getting access uh, to the easy repository. So for this, at least currently, you'll have to install CVMFS. And this requires admin privileges, so it's not for everyone. But if a sysadmin is willing to do that and doing some minor configuration, um, they can get all the all their users access to easy. Um, if you don't have admin privileges, you can use a container that includes CVMFS itself. And basically, in, at least inside that container and single node, you can very easily play with easy straight away, um, as long as you have Singularity or Aptainer installed. Then once you do get the access, you source the init script, which is shown in step two here in the, in the example below. And that's enough to start playing with all the software that we provide um, in easy. Um, so then you can start running Gromax or OpenFoam or TensorFlow, whatever. And the init script is smart enough that it will detect what type of CPU you have, whether it's an Intel Skylake or an AMD ROM or a RISC-V or whatever. Uh, variation, it will pick the right part of the software stack so you get optimized installations for this. Uh, so I, I really recommend pl people playing with this. So go to our documentation, check the pilot section and clone our easy demo GitHub repository where you get a couple of scripts to uh, to play with. So a small TensorFlow and, and OpenFoam uh, workload to, uh, to see how this works. And hopefully you will learn uh, a lot more about Easy because one thing I didn't mention here um, is that we have some Euro HPC funding through the uh, the multi-X scale project, and a big part of this is um, 
making easy ready for production and, and making it grow in terms of supported software and, and platforms. But that's going to start, that work is going to start early 2023 and it's going to run for four years. So uh, we, we think we can get a lot, a lot of stuff done um, in those four years. All right. And then we're ready to, to wrap up the presentation. I did promise a small surprise. Um, so we've been playing with EasyBuild for over a decade now. And yeah, sometimes you have to make some changes uh, to a project. Sometimes it's time for, for some refreshing. Um, and one of the aspects of EasyBuild is definitely up for a refresh. Um, we're, we're quite, we've been quite happy with this aspect for now, but we're very aware and I think everyone will agree that it can improve a lot. Um, we're, we, do, we did try to make it an evolution of what was there before. Um, and hopefully it looks a bit more professional and maybe it will cause some confusion initially, but hopefully not too much. Uh, but I think it, it will grow on us uh, eventually. So I'll wrap up the presentation, with the, the new easy build logo uh, that we've created, which I think looks a bit more professional and, and hopefully people see it as an, a way forward and an evolution of what was there before. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up, uh, wrap up the presentation here. And if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. So if you have any questions, maybe raise your hand um, in Zoom or post them in Slack and then hopefully Simon can keep an eye on those uh, and raise them. Or if nobody has questions as well, that's fine. Yeah, oh, we do see a question. Jed, go ahead. You can unmute now. Hi, 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 Kenneth. Thanks for the thanks for the presentation and thank you for uh, thank you and the rest of the community for for developing Easy Build. And I'm more of, of a user than a than a contributor. Although I, I although I do. Um, have done quite a lot of of my own um, 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 EBs uh, over the years. One of the things that I that that I suffer with or struggle from is oftentimes when I want to update one software package that has a long dependency chain. I have to go back and 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 update a lot of um, a lot of easy build. Um, 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 sorry, scripts. Easy, easy configs, yeah. E easy configs, yeah. Yep. And um, and sometimes it's straightforward. Sometimes you can use the try function, mm -hmm. but sometimes it doesn't really really work very well. And um, yeah, for example, when you want to just update to a new, to a newer compiler to a newer tool chain, mm -hmm. then that can really be a massive time suck. You know, <laughs> you you have some 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 software that has a lot of dependencies like uh, like GDAL I use I do a lot of GIS on HPC and then yeah so something like that um, has a lot of dependencies and then you end up spending a day or more updating easy configs mm -hmm. um, and I know that I may I know that maybe there's no sort of easy way to make it easier <laughs> But uh, but that that I would say that's the only that's the only and they're probably still the easiest thing. That's probably still the easiest way to do it compared to any other method for maintaining software on my on my cluster. But still, it seems like it takes a lot of time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there as as, sure. as, as the kind of thing I do. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. The, there are a couple of things here that that I think could help. So you've mentioned try, but do you mostly do try toolchain or? Are you also using try update depths, for example? So the, the try update depths method is, uh, and maybe you've muted again, but um, the try update depths method is, uh, is fairly new and is an experimental feature. It's definitely not perfect, um, but I think it, it does help a lot. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good idea. And actually, I didn't know about that. So I will yeah. I will try. That's a good that. And so yeah. when you so just a question on that, if you do a try like that, does it create um, a new easy config that yes. you could then um, you put in a PR? 
yes, it, it, when you do it try, you can actually, well, if you do it try, it will do, actually try the installation as well. If that's successful, you get the easy config file in the installation directory, but you can, you can combine try with copy EC. So that's also dash dash copy EC is just to copy an easy config file to somewhere. So the try will generate the easy config file and the copy EC will just copy it. And that way you're not trying to do the, the installation. When wow. you, when you, when you combine try tool chain with try update depths, it will yeah. not generate one easy config file, but multiple ones. So all the ones right. that it needs for the dependencies and either it will, I think it will either um, pick up new easy configs that are already there. And if not, it will just assume it, it will have to use the same, uh, the same software version uh, for the dependency that was already there. But at least that gives you a stack of easy config files to start from, to try with a new compiler tool chain and then see what breaks and what doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so that, I, I will tr I will try more with try. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's one thing. There's another thing which is currently not there yet, but which has been brought up recently is usually what EasyBuild does is um, when it's installing a whole bunch of things and one of them fails, it just gives up there straight away. And it doesn't continue with other things that it could be right. still trying to install. So it, it basically stops at the first breaking dependency. We could have a mode there that tells EasyBuild just keep trying and all the easy configs you find, try installing them until you've gone through all of them. And a lot of them will probably fail because of a missing dependency, but then others may not, and it, it can try and install everything um, that it can. And at least that way you have a more complete view on, on what is working and what doesn't. Um, that, that would already be helpful. And there was something else. Um, Oh yeah, there's there's some kind of an alternative to try as well, which is a feature that was started but never finished, um, which is maybe a bit more intelligent as well. And there's I think an open pull request in framework there that we should we should pop up again, where you can you get a bit more fine grain control over um, how easy build is generating a new easy config file based on an existing one, and that's probably a feature we should pick up again and and uh, and see if. Uh, if we can get that a bit more mature and, and get into easy build and, and maybe an experimental uh, implementation. Yeah. Great. So yeah, yeah thank you. It, it's great feedback. And I agree, this is one of the, the key pain points currently, but like you said, there's probably no, no magic bullet here. So no, no easy solution, but there are some things we can do to, to make it a bit less painful. The, the, the one other thing, while well, I'm still not muted, I just would also say that the doc documentation is helpful, but needs more examples. And I'm always thinking like, yeah, that's probably one thing where I could maybe try and contribute myself some stuff because it, it just, I learn it, you can learn a lot just by seeing how, how somebody already did something. And so having yeah. more examples in the documentation would be great. Yeah. Yeah, any contributions there are definitely welcome or just ideas of, of where we could add, add examples. Um, I'm not sure, have you looked at the easy build tutorial at all? Because there we, we do try to have some examples and even exercises with solutions along with them. Um, yeah, so maybe not in a long time. Yeah, I could go back and have a look at that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I think that has improved a lot. Like the, the tutorial we did at ISC 22, um, at least goes through the basics. We have a separate version, which was done for uh, the Lumi support team, which also covers more advanced features like hooks and has some very clear examples and, and even exercises on, on playing with these features. Um, right. And there we probably need to merge the tutorial and the documentation a bit more, or at least, um, yeah, get things a bit more organized and uh, structured so people don't miss and don't overlook these things. Yes, thanks a lot. Right. Great feedback, thanks a lot. Okay, York, I think you're next. Yeah, thanks. Um, two things. First of all, a big thank you for making easy build. It definitely makes my life easier. And also a very big thank you for all the help I received over the years with my sometimes probably trivial, but I didn't understand it problems. And sometimes they are like, okay, that is an issue now. Please raise an issue. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. And it cannot be said too often. Thank you. Um, one question I'm having is, you mentioned IPUs and TPUs. Do we actually have access to the, to these hardware? I, I currently don't. I, I know these things are around there. I also, I personally don't have a lot of experience in playing with these. I hope it's just installing another library and then this thing knows how to talk to, to this special purpose hardware, but I have no idea how, how these things work. Um, that, makes, that makes two of us. Um, I was 
trying to get my my um, fingers into IPU at the previous workplace. Um, then, of course, I've moved, and the um, PI I was talking to then um, became apparent, and so things were a little bit hmm, stalled. But I still have contact to the company. So I'm going to see them in December at the conference. So if you like, I can ask them if they would be interested in supporting us here. Yeah, getting access to the hardware is only a small a small part of it, right? So for ha having a need to actually play with that hardware is, an, is another thing. And then having time to actually develop what needs to be developed to, to support this is, is yet something else. But yeah, I, I guess getting access yeah. to additional hardware doesn't help at least to play around or to see uh, to see if there's easy easy changes we could make in um, in easy build. Like for for risk five, there's fairly minimal support for risk five currently in easy build. Um, by getting some ac access to um, emulated setups and things like this, but that's already helpful to maybe help other people uh, to get started on on that. So there's I, I think a couple of easy things we could do if, if you know where to where to look into or where to make changes that could help others to. Um, to start playing with these things, and, and yeah, anything we can do there, I think, makes sense. Yeah, I was I was thinking a little bit more in terms of collaboration because they are porting hardware. Uh, sorry, they are porting software. I can't promise anything, mm -hmm. but I can ask if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's could it. be interesting just just to yeah. see see what these things look like or um, what kind of work would be needed in easy build to support them. Well, just knowing that would already be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my my crazy ideas, and you know, I've got plenty of them. My crazy ideas, if they, if I can convince them that using Easy Build would make their life easier as well, and they can see a benefit here selling it to customers, I think that would be a win-win situation to, for everybody. Mm -hmm. But it is a crazy idea. I mean, it could well be they say no, thank you, no. There's a lot of things in, in Easy Build that has started out as crazy ideas and now everybody's using them. So I, and I think the GitHub integration is a, is a good example. Like I haven't seen a feature like this anywhere else, I think, but for Easy Build that has made a, a really big impact. Um, so yeah, sometimes crazy ideas are good. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot. All right, next question, Satish. You should be able to unmute. Yeah, uh, I hope you can, can hear me. Yes, hello. Hi, uh, I just had a question regarding the Easy Build uh, uh, framework itself. So the framework yep. has a lot of features, a lot of variables are used, a lot of functions are used mm -hmm. within the framework itself. And uh, to write some, some sort of easy block, uh, Typically, so this is a bit more involved. So it's not just easy configs, right? So just e so writing easy mm -hmm. blocks to make it easier, or to make uh, I I typically found that there is less documentation regarding the framework itself. Mm -hmm. Rather, uh, so I would have to search for a little bit newer easy blocks or compare them with somebody some uh, some other easy blocks which were uh, either written by you or someone else just just to know. What was changed in the uh, in the framework, or if, if there was a if, if there was a major change uh, mm -hmm. in the functions, or uh, even something just as simple as like say loose version or something like that. So yep. uh, uh, yeah, I've, so uh, is there going to be so you you've already shown that there's going to be a new place where the documentation is going to be. Is this also going to be addressed over there? Uh, that we yeah we, we can definitely do that so to, we already have um documentation on writing easy blocks from scratch with with examples even so in the easy build tutorial um but i think it's only in the lumi version there is a separate part in the tutorial that explains how to implement an easy block and it gives you a dummy software package to write an easy block for um, and it, it tries to guide you to doing that essentially from, from scratch. Now, that's a pretty basic easy block. It's, it's not something very advanced, but this could, this could be a good step. Um, and another thing is yeah, we can definitely add some more documentation on, on the easy build framework itself. Like what kind of functionality is in there that could be useful for easy blocks because not everything is. 
um, or having separate subsections on if you want to do something like this in in, um, in an easy block, what kind of functions are available or what kind of approach could you take with what framework supports today? Um, like running an interactive command, for example, something that needs an, a Q&A kind of thing. That's, that's one example. How does that work currently? Um, if you need to do something different depending on the software version that's being installed, how would you do this? So, so I think some very small examples, also coming back to what Jet mentioned, um, there we can definitely do a better job in, in the documentation, yeah. And yeah, this is, this is welcome in any form of the documentation, also in the current one. But I think the after the porting to Markdown, this will become a lot easier to start uh, to start adding things like this. Also, because the easy build tutorial is now written in Markdown, so the crossing things between the documentation and the tutorials is going to become a lot easier once they use the same format. Okay, and also some sort of uh, like an like an index uh, pointing towards all the all the let's say functions it may not be like a detailed index. But uh, uh, yep. just to just to see what sort of functions go in, go in so uh, because typically we are see uh, we can see these kind of things in a Doxygen uh, kind of a framework where you see mm -hmm. the where you see the function the inputs that go into it and uh, and hopefully the output that comes out of the function on, on uh, kind of documentation. So yep. since the framework itself has a lot of these. Um, maybe some some sort of an index will be also helpful i think i think it's just a suggestion and yeah. in the current documentation we already have an api section so if you go to the docs.easybuild.io and you look for api there's a link mm -hmm. there that has an overview of all the functions but searching through that is currently i think a small nightmare um, <laughs> and and that is something that we will we'll definitely keep an eye on for the new documentation that the, the search functionality is a lot better in mk docs um and we're going to make sure that when searching for things that you should hit in the in the API part of the documentation, which is something we still need to figure out, uh, we're going to try and make sure that yeah you're getting decent search results there. So if you look for a function to read a file, for example, that you can very easily find it through the search box. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's definitely something we'll, we'll keep an eye out for um, when wrapping up the the porting efforts. Yeah. 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 And, Thank you very and just, much. Yeah. Just to echo something, I'm not sure if Alex is in the call here, but. Alex, one of the easy build maintainers, has asked for uh, a more advanced easy build tutorial working through the framework from the ground up. So what is there? How is it structured? And how do you make changes to framework? But also, how, how can you leverage framework um, as best as possible? That's probably something we should we should create a dedicated, uh, more advanced tutorial for. Um, and this this would be, I think, very useful as well for people who write easy blocks. Oh, um, so. okay. Yeah, so hopefully we'll uh, uh, we'll find some time for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Pablo. Hi, can I, my, my question is not directly related to easy build, but to easy. Uh, okay. um, is uh, like, what, what do you think is missing to consider easy production ready? Or what, what are the main, that's a good a good question. The main thing that's missing is manpower. Um, so and and that's actually a solved problem now because we have funding. So starting January first next year, um, the multi X scale Europe Euro HPC project will start, and and a big part of that project is uh, providing a software service like like Easy does. So we're basically going to make Easy mature. Um, in there, uh, we'll have a couple of full-time people working on this, on just the service side of the project. So four or five full-time people for four years. Um, and that's mostly people who are already active in the EASY project. So that, that's very good, who are already know what needs to be done and already agree on, on how it should be done. So I, I think in the first, let's say six months to a year um, into that project, we'll, we should be able to make EASY really production ready. Um, what that involves is, a couple of things. We have to change our, our CVMFS setup a bit. So it's set up in a more secure way. Um, we have some dedicated monitoring for it. So if something goes wrong, we know it quickly enough. Uh, we'll set up some kind of uh, rotating support role. So if something goes wrong, there's always somebody around to, to try and mitigate those problems and, and fix them, uh, basically like you would do with any production setup. Um, and another big part of that is uh, before we want to make it production, we want to 
automate the way in which software is being added into Easy. So right now we're using Easy Build for that, but we're manually setting up the build environment with a container and then running Easy Build in that environment, letting it do the installation. Then we make a tarball of the installation, we upload it somewhere, and then it gets ingested. And then all of these uh, is too manual work. So humans are doing this shuffling this uh, this tarball around and setting up this build container. Um, and we're, we're creating a bot that does this automatically for us on the different types of CPUs. Um, uh, so that automates the whole process. That's first. So the humans don't have to do it anymore. And it also opens the door for people outside of the project to open a pull request and say, I want to add, uh, let's say, bow tie into easy. And all they do is to add a, a line with the bow tie version and the tool chain that should be used into a file. They open a pull request for that. And then the bot says, okay, I know what, the, what this means. I will go ahead and build this on the different CPU targets. Um, and then if a human tells me to deploy, I will deploy it into easy. So we're basically doing the same thing like we do with easy configs, um, but then to actually deploy something into, into easy. Um, and that's an effort that's already ongoing. And I think we're quite close to finishing that. Maybe this, that will still be finished this year. Um, and that's another, uh, let's say, requirement before we can make easy production. So we have a very good view on what needs to be done. We know how to do it. We're, we don't have the time yet to really do it the way we want to, but early next year, um, uh, we should have the time to do that. So hopefully by, let's say, summer or definitely the end of next year, things will look very different for easy and, and you'll be able to rely on it uh, way better than currently. Yeah, maybe Alan has something to add here. Yeah, just to, just to mention, I mean, there's some there's some technical stuff as well, right? So we have GPU support in the works um, for the CUDA stuff. Also, we've been considering how to do, how to deal with MPI implementations at different sites. So some people have vendor MPIs, right, that they have to use. Um, there are potential solutions here, but they need their yeah they need work right so i have worked in something called mpi trampoline a bit um to try and use that uh, which looks really positive for c and c plus plus but it's problematic with fortran and um, so basically that just gives you the same kind of approach as flexiblast it just gives you the it gives you the standard and then you can have whatever is behind the standard and use that um any implementation and um, yeah and but there are limitations there and maybe we can get around them. So I've again had contact with that developer last week, but it's probably these kind of things that, that are also in the way of adopting at a particular site. And but if you if you're already using open if you're already using Open MPI, you're in a pretty good place, I would say, with what's there. Yeah, so you'll you'll definitely hear more about this, Pablo, when when um, um, next year when we think Easy is ready for production, we will be very very vocal about it and you'll you'll definitely hear about it. Yeah, so keep an eye on it, let, let's say. Uh, keep an eye on the, on the easy Slack and maybe the easy Twitter account. And, and yeah, we'll probably hear about it in, in the easy build mailing list or Slack as well. But we can unmute you again if you have something else. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you and that uh, maybe in my opinion, maybe it will make sense to make it once the infrastructure part is in place, which I think is one of the main pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's just my opinion. Maybe I'm missing information because I'm not very involved in the project, but maybe it will make sense to make it available for people, uh, even if not the full GPU support is there and not full MPI support is there because, you know, uh, until you don't open to real end users, uh, you don't yeah you need the feedback from the user it's yeah. just my my view so maybe it's... And that that's definitely what we're going to do and that, that's also why we have the pilot repository already there which has some things like bioconductor and things like this so things that we know work are already there you can already play with these and that kind of structure or or the way you use it is not going to change much once we switch to the production setup and and maybe something interesting for you there was a, a bio hackathon last week in paris um, where somebody from SIB actually, um, Sebastian Moretti, was adding um, a bioinformatics pipeline to Easy. Uh, I were hitting some small issues there, mainly on ARM, um, but on x86, Intel and AMD, it's, it's basically just working. And we're now very close to ingesting all of these installations into Easy as well. Um, and then, especially I think for, for you and your users, there's stuff in there that they can very easily play with. 
um, and you can see whether they like it or whether they hit any any roadblocks. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you. So I, yeah. I will, uh, probably I will try to give it a try. Just to let you know, I'm trying to push easy across uh, because we have a project to collaborate across different Swiss uh, facilities. And well, my, my view on that is that we should help on easy. Yeah, so but for us, the, the main point will be once the contribution part is uh, is ready, so we can yep. really contribute to easy. Mm -hmm. And of course, I can only speak for myself and I am not a manager, but from our side, uh, from my side, I will try to push our teams to to contribute as yep. much as possible. Sounds good. And I think we're very close to opening up that that contribution workflow and having documentation on it and being able to provide help on it when when people are uh, are playing with that yeah all right Great. cool thank you thanks so thanks a lot okay do we have any questions in in slack uh simon or are we good to wrap up i think we're okay there's been Perfect. some talk but i don't think there are specific yeah. questions okay then unless somebody else has a question here i think i think we can wrap up Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, don't forget to have a beverage of your choice to celebrate the, uh, the, the start of the next decade of EasyBuild. Thanks a lot. See you around. Bye bye.